Shanghai, a condensed reading. Screenplay written by the Weehee Mahoney Brothers. The audio short produced by Pablo Mateos. Interior, limousine, night. Simon 30 sits in back of the sleek stretch, wearing a fine dark purple and green suit. He is holding hands with Penny, a feisty 26-year-old in jeans, t-shirt, and a beat-up leather motorcycle jacket. Simon finishes his cell phone conversation. You won't topple under UN scrutiny. A public scrutiny, a public outcry, global outcry. He knows he won't survive with the whole world watching. We're talking about children. Penny tweaks Simon's look while he speaks. They are a couple in love. If there's a change on the ground, I want to hear it from you there. Not from an angry man in London. Peace. Simon puts his phone away and kisses Penny. Come with me. Protect me. Your father's invite has your name on it only. The man is a monster. I only know one thing about your father, other than what you have told me. He shouldn't be trusted. I don't think he cares about trust. Respect? Fear? I don't fear him. Your naivete is adorable. Never change. He'll talk. I'll keep my cool. We'll try. Penny smiles as she watches Simon walk away from her and towards a massive glass skyscraper in downtown Shanghai. She shudders as she balls up into the back seat of the limousine. Penny knows exactly what Simon is walking into on this night. Interior, conference room, night. Simon enters the conference room. This is the room where all the big deals go down. The far wall is completely made off glass, which allows an amazing view of the Shanghai night sky. In the center of the room is a red oak table with seating for 20. On the other side of the table, gazing out of the window, is Abe Fowler, a stoic rock-solid man at 60 years of age. His black suit is even finer than Simon's. There are two stacks of files on the table, one stack red, the other black. Abe turns with a smile to address Simon. Ah, right on time. And the flight? One would find it hard to complain on one of your Gulf streams. Yes, one would. I've made hotel arrangements, uh, a suite at the Pudong Shangri-La Hotel. Excellent view. It showcases koi ponds and the floor of the master bath. I know. I stayed there last fall. Of course you did. Abe crosses the room with a bounce in his step and hugs Simon. The loving embrace is odd for Simon. Happy birthday, Simon, my boy. Thank you, father. What do you think? Of the office, of the building, interesting. I have to admit that part of the reason we acquired this company was because I fell in love with this building. You displaced the 700 employees who worked here because you fell in love with the view? The view? The land rights, tax incentives, and shipping lanes that were negotiated into the deal. I still follow the company's maneuvers from time to time. Business seems better than ever. The business can always be better. Supply and demand, expand or contract, sink or swim. Of course. Cut, streamline, ration, reduce management salaries, and the workers' wages. That is accounting's business. All firings were done lawfully and in most cases necessarily. Okay, I have to ask, why are you being so peculiar? Peculiar? How do you mean? Forgive me for saying, but you seem happy. I am happy. My youngest son is 30 years old today. I've been waiting a considerable amount of time for this day to arrive, and by my watch, adjusting for time zones, you will be exactly 30 in 17 minutes. It is my 30th birthday. I'm here in your Shanghai headquarters, the conference room on the 119th floor. Father, I conclude you want something. Yes, I do. Let's end the suspense. What is it that you want? Abe moves around the conference room performing a balestra, the footwork preparation in the art of fencing with an imaginary foil. I wanted this, a conversation, an assault with my son. I enjoy sparring with you. Never for blood as the rules of engagement insist. In my mind, there has never been clear victor one way or the other. Physically, emotionally, financially, you'd like to score your ten points and claim your trophy. On guard. Touché. 
Simon shows off his own fencing style. Financially, we both know you could buy me over a hundred times. Physically, it would give me little pleasure. I'm not even sure I'd be a match for you still. I imagine under that understated suit is still the fit body of a younger man who would quickly disarm me and repeat, relent, relent, relent. You never did relent. No, I didn't. Not back in our past. And now I have matured. So it wouldn't be a balanced duel. Abe pounces towards Simon, giving him a nudge, testing his son. And in with another swipe. Father, let's keep the night civil. The past is the past. Water under the bridge. Bygones. Time heals all wounds. For the first time, Simon takes notice of two stacks of files on the conference room table. One stack is red, the other is black. Abe runs his fingers across the top red file. Penny was apprehensive about our coming together after so many years. Maybe her apprehension is justified. Penny, your girlfriend, she counseled you not to come to this meeting. You and I have unresolved issues. I have to let her in so she can understand the dimensions. But her advice was not to come. But you know what? I'm glad we did. You and I should be able to sit down and talk, be open and honest with one another. To a degree, of course. Of course. Tell me about this, Penny. How did you two meet? I was taking the stairs down to the subway. My foot got wrapped up into the seam of my coat, and I rolled over forwards down the flight of stairs. Penny cleared a path. She knelt down, helped me to my feet, bandaged my wound right there on the platform with a butterfly bandage from her bag. Nurse Penny to the rescue. She was a field medic in the Middle East before becoming a nurse in the city. She does not like to talk about her tours. I gather we both witnessed the same sort of horrors in our work. She's like no other woman I've dated before. You don't have to tell me. And the two of you are moving in together? Yes, we are. I found a place in the village, closer to her work. Your trust fund pays your rent. The statement cuts through Simon like a knife. I know why I accepted your invitation to this meeting. I tell myself that you did your best to raise me. I can only assume you were damaged by your father in some way, but that's no business of mine. I chose to meet with you because I know I am of sound mind and body. I'm an adult who makes his own decisions. My life is my own. I couldn't live up to your expectations because I doubt I could look myself in the mirror while shaving. Abe ponders. A sinister side emerges as he strums the red files once again. Abe slides the top file across the table. It stops in front of Simon. What is this? That is a contract. What is this? What is this? What is this? That is the contract detailing the dissolution of your position in your company. I have been in negotiations with your board members, and they are in agreement with me. Upon signing that contract, and as of tonight, your company will be owned and operated by me. What is this? You can remain on the board as a figurehead, but you will not be entitled to a vote as a board member. Why? You have what I want, so I'm taking it. There is an infinite number of organizations in the world like mine. Why take mine? You were bouncing around from job to job, going nowhere fast, contemplating what it would mean to come to me with your tail between your legs asking for a job. But then you had a friend in India come to stay with you in New York. He was educating the limbless little children in the back alley slums of India. He was fighting red tape, fighting over limited funds. The two of you had some sort of lame philanthropic epiphany that if you were to combine forces, you could raise twice the money and teach twice the number of children. Sound math. You were succeeding in leaps and bounds. Your heart was somewhat in the right place, and most people could see that. But there was one person who saw the truth of what you were doing and why. One potential benefactor. One with deep pockets and right connections. A rival of mine. An enemy. Do you recall the crux of that first conversation with him? Yes. He was angry with you for blocking him in the purchase of a textile mill. He wanted to hurt you, personally. He wanted to wake each and every morning with a smile, knowing you, my son, was out in the world doing your work. 
knowing that your work was a direct insult to me. I could not control my own son. At that meeting, he wrote you a check, a sizable check. He exploited you for his own enjoyment. You are my son, but you were his puppet. You didn't care that you were being used because just under that layer of sanctimonious hogwash, you enjoyed the notion that you somehow bested me. Hey, I never... You loved the fact that we were ethical opposites. I am taking your company because it is mine. You built it off my back, my reputation. Everything you are today is because of me. My daydream scenario as a child was that you would be kidnapped and held for ransom. Weeks would go by before we received the first contact for a ransom. I wanted you to know what it felt like to have your life in the hands of someone else's will. In my daydream, the bandits took a pinky. Nothing drastic, nothing you couldn't live without. I dreamed about being the person who would have to drop off the ransom money. I wanted to be the first one to hug you and have you know that secretly, in the pit of my stomach, I was happy to see you taken away. Abe enjoys hearing the tale. I wish you a long, miserable life. But you thrive on misery, so I'm at a loss. Abe's own glibness only infuriates Simon. Do you have any friends left in this world? Not colleagues, not yes men, not servants. Friends. The only people who could tolerate spending time with you without thinking how detestable you are would be people who are just as horrible as you show yourself to be. 20 sociopaths at a table, counting money, and the amount of souls you could all crush between breakfast and brunch. A competition. The winner gets to shoot the last living panda bear between the eyes with a Samuel Colt 45. Abe uses his hand as a gun and shoots at an empty chair. You corrupt and destroy everything you touch. You are King Midas in reverse. Rivers dry up, crops die. All of Earth's solar panels will cease to function because of you, because you will eclipse the sun. Abe shrugs off the comment. Please tell me that in your will you have set the design of your own headstone because you wouldn't want to leave it up to me. Because if you leave it up to me, it reads like this. Here lies Abe Fowler, husband, father, businessman, and human being, a failure at all four. Or are you simply going to be cremated? If you are, I'll simply flush you down the toilet. Do you hate me? I feel sorry for you. You really shouldn't. Abe slowly walks closer to his son. I never hit you as a child. Perhaps I should have knocked you around. Perhaps a beating from time to time would have strengthened your spine. I don't really think... Abe slaps Simon in the face, knocking him to the floor. Simon opens his mouth to speak, but Abe slaps him again. Your thoughts are lies. You're full of lies. Your life's a lie. Abe storms back to the stack of red files. He picks up the top one and reads from it. Simon has expressed homicidal feelings towards his father, fantasizes about his father's abduction, ponders on what it would feel like to have his father's head sent to the family in a box. My head. Not a pinky. My head. I would call that drastic. Simon uses the conference table to get back to his feet. Those are the notes from the therapist that you and mom sent to me while I was in high school. Those are confidential. Nothing is confidential when it comes to my own self-preservation. I was just a kid lashing out to any adult who would listen. What would your life be without me? What purpose would you serve without using me to rebel against? I don't see a man before me. I see a spiteful, harmless, pathetic child. You say my being could eclipse the sun? Perfect. You thrive in my shadow. You are hunkered down in my blackness. Look at me. I'm doing such a wonderful job, saving the world in spite of my privileged upbringing and all of who my horrible, evil father is. Simon is being beaten into the ground with his father's choice words. His legs wobble. He is forced to take a seat at the table. Abe returns to Simon's side and towers over him. What is it you want from me? I want you to admit the truth. What do you want me to say? 
I need you to admit the truth. Abe smacks Simon in the back of the head. You are not going anywhere. This is my night. I flew you halfway around the world to get you to confess. You were not a man, you were a child, a baby. The same kid who ran and hid instead of facing me. Please, stop it. Stop what? Explaining you to you? Never. Stop being your father? Impossible. I'm right here. I've always been right here. You are not going to disappoint me tonight. I don't understand what you're saying to me. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what you've been dying to tell me every day since you've had a brain cell in that thought of an empty bucket head of yours. Relent. 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 Simon covers his ears and puts his head down on the table, but his anger grows. Abe backs off, disappointed. Simon balls his fist, stands up, walks to his father. Abe turns. Simon punches Abe in the mouth. Abe falls to the ground, stunned, satisfied. Simon, full of rage, stands over his father. Say it. I hate you. For how long? I've always hated you. Simon looks at his fist. Emotion overcomes him as he sees his father on the ground, seemingly broken. His rage scares him. Simon collapses into a chair. Abe rises from the ground and places his hand on Simon's shoulder to console his son. Simon tries to weasel out of the undeserved touch. I am proud of you, Simon. It is your 30th birthday, and today you will become your own man. You had to admit the truth to me, and now I can set you free. Completely. Abe puts his arms around Simon in a hugging gesture. I've always known you hated me. It troubled me for years while you were still living in my house. I tried to sway your feelings toward me, but your mind was made up at such a young, tender age of about eight. I felt that you were completely lost to me. But then his hug becomes tight. You know me. You know the kind of man I am. If you hate me, I must hate you. You become my enemy. The hug is too tight. I told you that I've been waiting a considerable amount of time for this night to arrive. Thirteen years. Simon senses danger. You are not going to like what I'm about to tell you. Simon tries to break free, but Abe holds fast. You are not going to believe me when I tell you that I promise you that is categorically, demonstrably true. Abe hunkers down, immobilizing Simon. He leads into Simon's ear and whispers, I have paid for every romantic and sexual relationship you have ever had. Simon stops struggling. His life force exits his body. Abe releases Simon and walks to the head of the table to stand behind the stack of black files. Like a card dealer in Las Vegas, Abe slides the files from the stack across the table so they stop in front of Simon. Eleven of them. They pile up in front of Simon. Simon slowly goes through the files, one by one. Each folder contains a wealth of information about eleven different women Simon has dated. Pictures, bank statements, emails, text messages, receipts. This isn't possible. I assure you it was, and is. Simon flips through another file in denial. Lies. A joke. Something your twisted mind would find humorous. These files prove nothing. Ferris wheel material. You have me going around and around in my mind, rethinking every day in my life. Congratulations. A lame hoax. I owned every smile you've ever enjoyed. Today, I smack those smiles off your face. You had to pay the price for your hatred for me. Today, I collect. I don't see a file on Penny. That's right. There is a moment of hope for Simon. She has hers with her. She'll be joining us shortly. There is no hope for Simon. I know what you're thinking. Impossible. Simon stacks up the 11 folders. Given a hundred lifetimes, I will still never understand you. I spent years trying to find a way to forgive you for what you have done to me. I didn't catch all that. Simon gets up from the table ready to leave the conference room, but he stops. He centers himself. Simon returns to the table. There is a positive change in his disposition. You flew me to Shanghai in a private jet to rip my life apart. 
Abe sees the change in Simon's mood and it confuses him. You have been happier than I've ever seen you. I shouldn't feel sorry for you. All these years, the joke's on me. You wanted me to hate you. You needed me to say the words, I hate you, so you could feel right in destroying my life. I did not get where I am in the world by ever being wrong, but I had to be sure. I did not get where I am in the world by ever letting those who hate me thrive without opposition. There is no saving you, is there? Simon deals the files back to Abe. These might have been women of substance at some point, but the thought that you could corrupt them only makes them weak in my mind. The thought that they became who they are for vast amounts of money only makes you a pimp and them whores. Simon moves around the table, gathering more steam. Abe does not like this at all. No. You corrupted those women in the way you tried to corrupt me as a child. My thoughts are that you created this myth of a life for me so I could be brought down to your level. You tried to make me as much of a cynic towards the human race as you are. How far could one person go to hurt another? And why? To what ends? I can assume you are not seeking forgiveness. Simon slowly approaches Abe. Abe feels the need to retreat as his master plan falls apart. Count that as a rhetorical question, Father. My whole life I've been searching for a way to forgive you. You've crossed a line. The line. There's no going back. Your Gulfstream provides round-trip service. I will leave this conference room and never return. I'll never have to try to please, hurt, or keep you in my thoughts again. The two men stand nose to nose. Simon reaches down and takes his father's hand. He shakes it goodbye. Thank you for freeing me, Abe. Simon turns his back on Abe and walks for the door. Flustered, Abe pulls out his phone and dials. Penny, it is time. The name Penny drains all of Simon's confidence. Penny enters. Her hair is now up, high on her head. Confidence. The woman is striking in a long red silk Chinese-style dress. A woman transformed. She has a gnarly scar that runs along her collarbone and neck. She carries expensive high heel shoes in one hand. She carries her black file in the other. She tosses her file onto the table in front of Simon. He does not turn around to greet her. Was it just for the money, Pen? No. The afternoon you fell at my feet was just another day for me. I was content to patch you up and send you on your way, so I could go about mine. I was living and working in a blur, a patient, a victim, a child could enter my care. I fix them, and they then move on. An assembly line of misery, pain, sickness. I was a machine, fearing I would malfunction and collapse to the floor under the pressure of my own empathy. Are we done here? Penny glares at Abe with a look that could halt a battalion. I knew I needed to care, but I could not bring myself to do so. Was I really going to live the rest of my life in this manner? The money gave me an incentive to care, a trial run at life. You fell in love with the old me. I started to like her as well. I hope she does not disappear. I left your birthday present on the dining room table. You still have my number. Call me if you want to talk. Penny turns to leave but returns to whisper into Simon's ear. Your resentment towards your father, though with tremendous cause, will hold you back for the remainder of your years if you don't let it go. Methinks tonight will be a great night to start. What else could he possibly have out his sleeve? I don't give a damn about your father, and he's no longer a part of my business. But you never told me why you hate him. Maybe that's something the two of you should work on. Penny holds up the shoes. Thanks for the dress and sneakers, Mr. Fowler. Penny exits the conference room. If nothing else, I hope this night taught you to be less trusting. The people to try to help will eventually suck you dry. And as I said before, everyone wants something. If it is not your money, it is your influence, stature, or time. And now you have all the time in the world to do as you wish. Start a new life as a true Trustafarian. Now you will see the world as I do. 
but with fresher eyes. You never asked me why I hated you. I've waited a considerable amount of time to tell you. Twenty-two years. A single event all those years ago has led us to where and who we are tonight. Simon sits down at the table. You might want to take a seat, Dad, because my explanation may take a while. For the full story, contact us via our Facebook page, Shanghai, by the Weehi Mahoney Brothers, or the email address of email patrick, I-N-L-A, at yahoo.com. 